This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. When it came time for the March 10th, 1947 broadcast of Sherlock Holmes, Tom Conway was home suffering from a bad cold. <laughs> Panic set in as the producers hurriedly searched for someone to temporarily replace Conway. Of course, it had to be someone who sounded British. And Wilms Herbert and Herbert Rawlinson had appeared on the Sherlock Holmes series many times, but their voices were too old sounding and they weren't English, so Ben was chosen. His voice seemed just right. And the fact he had already appeared on the show in numerous roles made him the logical choice anyway. I do believe Ben Wright's performance, says Holmes, on the show you are about to hear, is what convinced the producers of the 1950 series to choose him to portray Sherlock Holmes. I'll return shortly with some more reflections on my friend Ben. But first, let's listen to Ben Wright as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson in the case of the Egyptian curse. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, owing to Mr. Conway's illness, the part of Sherlock Holmes will be played by Mr. Ben Wright. And now for our weekly visit with Sherlock Holmes' famous colleague, your friend and mine, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I'm glad to see you. Make yourself at home. Thank you, Dr. Watson. You know, I've been waiting eagerly all week to hear about the singular affair of the ancient Egyptian curse. And the most singular affair it was, to be sure. It had its beginnings in the august halls of the British Museum. I've been looking over my old records to refresh my memory, and even after all these years, it sends what in Scotland they call a cow grew down my spine. <laughs> I can hardly wait, Dr. Watson. Recently, in a poll conducted throughout the country, women picked the ten best groomed men in America. These men were all men at the top, statesmen, governors, motion picture stars, producers, and millionaires. And men... I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing how a recent survey showed that Kreml hair tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives and most successful men. But then why shouldn't it be? Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. Such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Kreml also keeps the hair neatly in place longer with a healthy-looking luster. Yet it never leaves your hair looking or feeling greasy. After you apply Kreml, you can rub your hand over your hair and your hair always feels so delightfully clean. Notice, too, how no greasy film comes off on your hand or on your hat band. Just use a little Kreml on your hair in the morning, and at night your hair looks as neatly groomed as when you first combed it in the morning. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson... What about the singular affair which began in the sacrosanct confines of the British Museum? Well, I must admit that I was not a frequent visitor to those gloomy halls, but on this particular morning, Holmes had been insistent. All scientists in London, especially the archaeologists, were agog over the arrival of Lord Cranwood's sensational Egyptian discoveries. For several days, Holmes had been deeply immersed in research among the Cranwood antiquities, so that now I find myself in the Egyptian gallery of the British Museum. I say, Watson, look here. This notation definitely proves the use of stringed instruments as well as flutes as early as 3000 B.C. Hmm? Very interesting, Holmes. Very interesting indeed. If you please, sir. The smoking is absolutely forbidden. Huh? Oh, all right, all right, all right. Uh, hello, Holmes. Oh, Watson, I don't think you know Professor Halliday of the British Museum. Professor, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson? Not the eminent Dr. Eustace Watson, the well-known archaeologist of Edinburgh. I'm honored. No, sir. Dr. John H. Watson of Baker Street. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is Dr. Watson's first visit to all your magnificent new acquisitions, Professor Halliday. It's a veritable treasure house, gentlemen. The late Lord Cranwood's excavations at the site of ancient Abydos have given the museum a priceless mine of information. And yet the price in human lives has not been inconsiderable. 
First Lord Cranwood himself, only a few days after the shrine of Harshafit was opened. A man of almost 80, Mr. Holmes. The strain and excitement of the discovery were too much for him. No doubt. And then a month later, Dr. Duma, disappearing mysteriously from camp, only to be found hopelessly insane and babbling madly before he died. And young Wilson, vanished into thin air and assumed to have been lost overboard from the ship that was bringing the expedition back to England. Oh, it was a calm, moonlit night. Don't tell me that you, of all people, believe this newspaper talk of Hashafit's curse, Mr. Holmes. I believe nothing that is not susceptible of proof, Professor. Evidently, the new Lord Cranwood is quite undisturbed by any threats of a curse upon his family. I've seen him working here every day this week. Oh, is that Lord Cranwood? Yes, the uh, heavy-set, middle-aged man over there, just beyond that fifth sarcophagus. With which? A chap with a rather florid face, just packing those notes into his briefcase. Oh, looks fit enough, I must say. Judging from his appearance, I should think the curse of a what's-his-name wouldn't have much luck with him. Oh, you'll excuse me, gentlemen. I want a word with Lord Cranwood before he leaves. Oh, Sir Holmes, supposing I run along, I'll meet you at the club for lunch and... Uh... Oh, Lord Cranwood, what's the matter? Why, he, he's collapsed. Quick, Watson. I, I don't understand. He just seemed to keel over. Well, let me take a look at him. You were standing right beside him, Professor. Just what happened? Oh, I was speaking to him. He clutched his throat, tried to say something, and collapsed. Holmes. Yes, Watson? The man's dead. Impossible. Cause of death, Watson? Well, I should have said heart, but... But uh, the uh, curious rigidity of the muscles of his hands and throat aren't consistent with that diagnosis. Is that it, Watson? Quite correct, Holmes. You would better notify Scotland Yard at once, Professor Halliday. Scotland Yard? Mr. Holmes, are you suggesting... I suggest nothing, Professor Halliday. But Lord Cranwood has died extremely suddenly. In view of the three previous deaths which have occurred among the members of the expedition, I feel that this is definitely a matter for the police. I'll send for them at once. I'm certain, Watson, that a second look at Lord Cranwood's body will suggest to your mind a cause of death with which you cannot be un unfamiliar. After your army career in India, the congested eyeballs, the rigid neck muscles. You mean snake bite? Precisely. The bite of some venomous and highly poisonous snake is the only cause consistent with these appearances. But there are no snakes here in the British Museum? That, Watson, is why I sent for Scotland Yard. Well, you've been pacing up and down now for two solid days, Holmes. Would it be too much to ask you to be seated for at least five minutes? I'm sorry, Watson. The lack of any satisfactory solution to the problem of Lord Cranwood's death has driven me almost out of my mind. You find the problem insoluble, then? <sighs> so far. Come in. Ah, Inspector Lestrade. I've been expecting a call from you. Yeah, this thing's fair got me beat, Mr. Holmes. Oh, no, sit down, Inspector. Can I get you a drink? Thank you, Doctor. I'll be glad of one. <laughs> Well, we've got the coroner's verdict, Mr. Holmes, and much good it does us. Death by misadventure from unknown causes. Well, you could hardly expect a coroner's jury to say more. Did the Home Office pathologist confirm my opinion? Uh, here you are, Mr. Well, Holmes. thank you, Doctor. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes, all the appearances of death were consistent with the bite of some deadly snake. But did we find any snakes running around? Were there any snake bites on the deceased body? No. <laughs> Why, you yourself, within a few yards of the man, Mr. Holmes, and you know as well as I do that if a man gets bitten by a snake, he's going to let out a yell. I know exactly how you feel, Lestrade. Yeah, and have you seen the papers? <laughs> Scotland Yard baffled by 5,000-year-old curse. Death strikes again from Egyptian tomb. You can't blame the journalist, Lestrade. It's a newspaper editor's dream. And Scotland Yard's nightmare. <laughs> well, I must be off. The commissioner wants to see me this afternoon. You can be thankful this isn't one of your cases, Mr. Holmes. I think this one would be too much even for you. Phew. I've never seen a stroud quite so worked up before. And I can't say that I blame him, Watson. Well, come along. Since the late Lord Cranwood's funeral is to take place at two o'clock, we might well stroll over to Hanover Square. Perhaps a brisk walk may serve to blow the cobwebs from our brains. <laughs> First time I've known you stand about outside a church at a funeral, Holmes, peering at the relatives of a dead man. I'm anxious to see the new Lord Cranwood, as well as his relatives. He was a nephew of the late Lords, you know, and the family's interest in Egyptology has been inherited by him, along with the title. Here they come. There's the new Lord Cranwood. Oh, 
I wouldn't want to be in his boots with a curse hanging over me head. There's Lord Cranwood, Watson. Husky looking young chap. Looks as though it'd take more than a family curse to get him down. Who's that coming after him, the pale young fellow in the wheelchair? His cousin, a Mr. Neville Robertson, I believe. Been hopelessly paralyzed ever since boyhood. Horse rolled on him while hunting. Yes, the lines of pain and suffering are very evident in the poor fellow's face. That must be Robertson's older brother, Mr. Oliver Robertson. That rather heavy set young man just coming out. I assume that's his wife with him, the, the girl with the black veil. Well, it's rather rough on them, all these curious people staring. Come along, Holmes. Let's be off. Very well, Watson. I've seen all that I. I beg your pardon, sir, but aren't you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Yes. Well, my name's Oliver Robertson. Fortunate coincidence, my seeing you here. I'd intended sending you a message this evening. A message? Yes, I I wanted you to... Well, this is hardly the place to discuss such matters. Look, I'm staying at my cousin, Lord Cranwood's house. I wonder if you'd be good enough to come there this evening. Would nine o'clock be satisfactory? Excellent, Mr. Holmes. Good day, sir. Good day, Mr. Roberts. <laughs> Come in, gentlemen. Come in. I don't think you know my wife. Dear, may I introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes? How do you do? And this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? I'm very happy to see you here, Mr. Holmes. And you too, Dr. Watson. Mr. Holmes, my wife and I, well, to put it frankly, have asked you to come here because we're afraid. Not for ourselves, but for my cousin, the new Lord Cranwood. Mr. Holmes, neither Oliver nor myself is of a nervous temperament. If you've read the accounts of the Cranwood expedition... You must appreciate my feeling that we're contending against more than mere ill fate. Four members of the same small group, dying mysteriously or by violence within a few weeks of each other. Well, sir, you don't put any stock in all this talk about an ancient Egyptian curse? No, I, I don't really know. Uh, tell me, Mr. Robertson, does the new Lord Cranwood share your fears? I regret to say he does not. He laughed when I told him I'd asked you here. Am I interrupting a council of war, or may I be permitted to be present? Oh, come in by all means, Neville. Here, let me give you a hand with your wheelchair. I can manage, I can manage. My brother Neville, gentlemen, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you, do, How do, you do? I assume that the presence of the celebrated sleuth of Baker Street is not unconnected with the curse of the Cranwood. Please, Neville, don't make fun of us for being frightened. Oh. After all, it's Derek we're worrying about, not ourselves. Time enough for you to worry, Oliver, when the curse catches up with Derek. Then you'll be Lord Cranwood yourself, and it'll be my turn to start worrying. I gather, Mr. Robertson, that you are somewhat skeptical regarding the efficacy of Hasha Fitz's 5,000-year-old curse. My granduncle died of heart failure after the excitement of discovering the tomb. Dr. Dumas' death was certainly not the first case of sunstroke that's ever been heard of in Egypt. And Wilson, who fell overboard from the ship, was notoriously fond of the bottle. Does that answer your question? Ingenious, Mr. Robertson, but it leaves out of account your uncle's death in the British Museum the other day. I could offer you a dozen theories to account for that, but I doubt if they'd be sensational enough to please you. Mr. Holmes, regardless of what my cousin may say, and I know he'll agree with my brother, I wish to engage you to prevent any repetition of the tragedies which have already struck this family. Do say you will, Mr. Holmes. I will do my best, Mr. Robertson, to keep Lord Cranwood safe from harm, but without his cooperation, I greatly fear that I... Stimson said he wanted to see me, Oliver. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't know you had guests. I very much want to see you, Derek. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. My cousin, Lord Cranwood, gentlemen. How do you do? I'm sorry, gentlemen. I have no sympathy with my brother's fears, nor do I see any necessity for dragging detectives into this matter. I trust you'll excuse me. Good night. Well... You see, Mr. Holmes, it's just as I told you. But I do hope you'll do your best anyway, Mr. Holmes. I promise you I shall. And your task won't be made any easier, Mr. Holmes, by my cousin's stubborn determination to continue working at the museum. He's arranged with Professor Halliday to work there at night in the future, uh, beginning tomorrow. He wishes to avoid the stairs of the curious. Hmm, it's interesting. Great Scott, my watch must have stopped. 9.30 and I haven't as yet fed my snakes. Snakes? Did you say snakes? Why, yes, Doctor. Since my affliction debars me from digging in Egyptian tombs and similar active pastimes, I amuse myself with a small herpetarium. Would you care to see my collection? Good heavens, no. Oh, some other time, perhaps, Mr. Robertson. Dr. Watson and I must be off. Good. Snakes. <laughs> I must say, Holmes, that I find that sinister cripple Neville and his nasty collection of poisonous reptiles highly suspicious. Well, there's no doubt that Neville's personality has been warped by his affliction. 
And the availability of snake venom is, of course, significant. And look at his motive, Holmes. Look at his motive. The Cranwood title and the Cranwood fortune. But there's one thing you've forgotten, Watson. Even if the new Lord Cranwood were to die, it would be Neville's older brother who would inherit. Oliver and his wife would become Lord and Lady Cranwood. Are you trying to tell me that a murderer who'd kill two men would boggle at a third? If Cranwood dies and Oliver gets the title, he'd be the last barrier in Neville's way. I don't like to say it, Holmes, but for once you seem to be singly obtuse about the facts of this case. Possibly, Watson. At any rate, I intend that you and I shall be present, although concealed, when Lord Cranwood visits the Egyptian galleries tomorrow night. You mean that you anticipate an attempt upon his life? As I have told you on previous occasions, Watson, it's a great mistake to theorize ahead of one's data. Sir Holmes, you, you, don't, uh, you don't really put any faith in all this talk about a supernatural curse. Do you, Watson? I, I... Uh, oh, gosh, no, no, of course not. Good. Well, then I trust that tomorrow night you will arm yourself with your service revolver. Oh, really? Yes, Watson. I should like to be in readiness for anything we may encounter at the British Museum. Supernatural or otherwise. place at night, isn't it? Carve humanity? Yes. What do you mean? Merely that the relics of the past are all about us. Oh, yes, 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 of course, sir. Oh, oh, on this way, to the northern vestibule. I say, Holmes, what's that thing? Looks like a coffin. That's what it is. Oh, good, good. Ah, uh, here we are. Ah, uh, he'll no doubt work at that long table. It has the only decent light in the room. Now, you take that side of the table, Watson. I'll take this. And make certain there's no one and nothing concealed. You're, you're, you're not expecting to find a, a snake anywhere, are you, Holmes? I don't expect to find anything. I merely wish to make certain that there is nothing to find. Now, yeah, careful, Watson. Don't knock over that little figure. What the devil is it? And the Egyptians call those little statues the answerers. They were buried in the cedar coffins within the sarcophagi to accompany the dead... And to obey their orders. Well, pleasant idea, I must say. Well, there's nothing hidden on this side of the table. Nor oh, here. Yeah. Now, now, there's an excellent spot to conceal ourselves. Over here, Watson. Great. God, what a horrible sight. What sort of a nightmare is that? And appropriately enough, it's a statue of Harshafit, a ram-headed god. Oh, excellent, Watson. Now, this will do perfectly. We can see everything in the room from behind well, here. Just what are you expecting, Holmes? I don't know. Quiet. There's someone coming. It's Lord Cranwell. Yes, he's taking his papers out of his briefcase. Oh, now that he's turned the lamp up, I can see a bit better. Oh, he's all right so far. He's settling down to work. What? Something's wrong. Quick! He must have fainted. Here's the antitoxin. Give him the injection. Hurry! It's too late, Holmes. He's dead. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson as they endeavor to solve the mystery of the ancient Egyptian curse. Men, if you want to be a success in life, remember that well-groomed hair adds a great deal to a man's appearance. And one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So start at once and take better care of the hair you've got. And if you're smart, you'll use Cremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly in place without looking or feeling greasy. But men, Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Cremel's light oils have a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, Cremel removes itchy, loose dandruff. Notice how alive and tingling your scalp feels. And you like to massage Cremel on your scalp because it's such a clean product. It never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair, like so many men's, is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So men, 
For handsome groomed hair and a more hygienic scalp, use Cremel daily. Buy a bottle of Cremel at any drugstore. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Hair Tonic. That famous modern hair tonic which has become such a nationwide favorite. And now back to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson and our story. I say, Holmes, if you won't have any lunch, do at least take a cup of tea. No, thank you, Watson. I'm not hungry. You've been saying that ever since that poor fellow Derek was killed the night before last. You simply must eat, Holmes. My appetite will return when I have a solution for this case, Watson, and not before. Well, I've, I've hesitated to say it, Holmes, but uh, if that man had died by any natural means in front of our very eyes, I'm perfectly certain that you would have solved the riddle. Well, if your hypothesis is correct, Watson, this case is not a matter of the mortal's minds. And that I refuse to admit. Well, we saw him come in, we saw him open his briefcase, he turned up the lamp, sat down... Thank and... you, Watson. Thank me for what? You've just given me some remarkably interesting food for thought. Oh, really? Come in. Why, Mrs. Robertson? Oh, I, I beg your pardon. It's Lady Cranwood now, isn't it? Makes me unhappy to say that it is, Dr. Watson. Won't you sit down, Lady Cranwood? I've already expressed to your husband my deep feeling over the tragedy I failed to prevent. Let me assure you, Mr. Holmes, that neither my husband nor I feel that you were in any way to blame. I appreciate your kindness, Lady Cranwood, but I... Still blame myself for having failed to reach a solution. And that is why I've come to see you this morning, Mr. Holmes. I... I hardly know how to say it. My suspicion is such a horrible one. Oh, there, 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 my dear. I'm convinced that Oliver is in deadly peril. And... And from his own brother. Oh, do, do you hear that, Holmes? You felt it too, Dr. Watson. Oh, I've been fighting down a horrible thought, denying it even to myself. But I felt I had to tell you, Mr. Holmes. Well, have you any proof, Lady Cranwell? Anything definite on which to base such an accusation? Only Neville's snares and his jealousy of my husband. And those horrible snakes of his. Perhaps you may be able to assist me in confirming or disproving your suspicions of Neville, Lady Cranwell. Anything I can do, Mr. Holmes. Anything. I imagine that the entire family and the servants as well will all be attending the funeral this afternoon. Yes, of course. Then if you will be good enough to leave me your key to the house... I shall take advantage of everyone's absence to go there and investigate one or two possibilities that have occurred to me. Of course, Mr. Holmes. Head us the key. Thank you. And one other thing. I should appreciate it if you would ask your husband to meet Watson and myself at the museum tonight, about nine o'clock. At the museum? Yes. I feel that a reenactment of the late Lord Cranwood's death may bring us to a solution. If you think it's necessary, Mr. Holmes. I think it is vitally necessary. Very well. I will ask my husband to meet you at the museum at nine. I must go now. Goodbye. Goodbye, Dr. Watts. Uh, goodbye. Poor woman, no wonder she's overwrought. Come, Watson. Your hat and stick. We have work to do. Cranwood's house, you mean? Well, I shall go there this afternoon. But meanwhile, I want you to take a note to Lestrade at Scotland Yard and personally see to it that he gets it. And then? Meet me at nine o'clock tonight at the British Museum. <laughs> I must say, Holmes, that as long as we had to come back to this chamber of horrors, I'm glad that you insisted on a decent amount of illumination. Since we won't be concealing ourselves this evening, Watson, I asked Professor Halliday to leave the Egyptian gallery fully lighted. Now, you sit here, Watson. Well, as long as none of the professors are about, Holmes, I don't suppose the museum will be shaken to its foundations if, if I smoke the pipe. Ah. Huh, that's better. Good evening, Lord Cranwood. Good evening. Lady Cranwood? Uh, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Good evening. Well, I fail to see what purpose will be served by a reenactment of my cousin's tragic death, but well, I'm willing to do anything within my power that will offer any hope. I insist on coming with Oliver, Mr. Holmes. I'm afraid every moment I'm away from him. And now, Lord Cranwood, let us try in every way to duplicate your cousin's actions of two nights ago. I have here his briefcase, and I'd like you to enter through those doors, carrying the briefcase in your left hand... And humming a tune. All right. Ready? All right, go ahead. <clears throat> now, uh, 
Put the briefcase down on this table. Take off your hat and coat and put them on the table. Any particular place you want them? I'll just place them on the table as your cousin did. Now, open the briefcase. Oh, I thought I... What were you about to say? Uh, Nothing. You were about to say, Lord Cranwood, that you thought the ingenious adaptation of the Borgia's poison needle had been removed from its mount in the briefcase lock. What on earth are you talking about? I found that fiendishly clever mechanism in your study this afternoon. Count, what do you mean? I mean that this briefcase was fitted with a poison needle, which was removed after Derek's death. Oh, no. And which I replaced when I found it at your house this afternoon. How horrible, how utterly vile. I also found some of the poison, Lord Cranwood. And I greatly fear that when I remounted the needle in the briefcase after my experiments, some of the venom may have remained on it. It was, Neville. Bluff, Holmes. Sheer bluff. You wouldn't dare. If you think I'm bluffing, Lord Cranwood, why is your face going so pale? You're clutching your arm with your other hand. Why? Uh, Fiend, it was poison. Oh, no. My arm's swelling. It's going numb. There's no feeling left in my hand. No, no, no. Mr. Holmes must be mad. Must you, Holmes? You've killed me. All right, I did it. I killed the others, but... You'll never hang me! Oh. All right, Lestrade. There's your confession. It's a confession, all right, oh. Dr. Holmes, but all you've given us is the corpse of a murderer. Yes! You've killed him! Not a bit of it. He's only collapsed from fear. Holmes, the pain in his arm, the symptoms. Merely a harmless, though painful solution which I placed on the poison needle. Oh. Catch her, Watson. She's fainting. And Oliver's a fiend, Holmes, an absolute fiend. Oh, unquestionably. But you must admit that his hiring us was an ingenious attempt at a novel method of removing all possible suspicion from himself. And now he'll pay the penalty for murdering at least two men. A good thing, too, although I'm sure I don't know how you ever found out about the briefcase. Why, you gave me the clue, Watson. You yourself. I did? Back in Baker Street when you were talking about the second death. You mentioned that we had seen Lord Cranwood enter the room. Open his briefcase. Well, we did. Exactly. But until you mentioned it, the significant fact had escaped me that the only object common to both deaths and handled by both men was the briefcase. Good gracious me. Well, that solves the mystery of the ancient Egyptian curse. Does it, Watson? Have you forgotten the three who died previously under such strange circumstances after they had opened Harshapit's temple? You, uh... You don't mean that you really believe in that stupid curse? Those three deaths have still not been explained, and I doubt that they ever will be. There are powers, Watson, higher powers, of which we poor humans still know nothing. Ladies, the poet who said a woman's hair was her crowning glory certainly knew what he was talking about. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell, because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair, never under any circumstances, and it's Cremel Shampoo. Yes, Cremel Shampoo is simply wonderful. It actually glamour bays each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural, dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural, glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's entirely different. Cremel shampoo never hurts the texture of your hair. You can use it as often as you wish, over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact, it has a beneficial built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, next week I think I'll tell you a story about the strange and ferocious behavior of Professor Presby's dog. And the even stranger behavior of the professor himself. I call it The Adventure of the Creeping Man. (laughs) 
Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Study in Scarlet. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tonight, the part of Sherlock Holmes was played by Mr. Ben Wright. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the creeping man. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Though Ben was a preeminent character actor on the British stage, once he came to America, he quickly adapted to the then pre-television world of dramatic radio. Once, during a break from his role as host of the previous Baker Street Associates release of the Sherlock Holmes series, he quietly commented, and I quote, Radio was the most civilized form of entertainment I have ever appeared in. How true. Radio was truly Ben's home. In his 70s, semi-retired, he was surprised and delighted that anyone would choose him to act as host for a series of Holmes radio broadcasts. Though he was not a Holmes aficionado, he loved the stories and enjoyed completely assuming the role of the great detective of the 1950 series. That he would once again contribute to bringing back the Sherlock Holmes series delighted him even more. The two episodes you've just heard, Q for Murder and The Case of the Egyptian Curse. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.